Good morning. Welcome to the parallel session in this conference of urban resilience in the, con in the context of climate change. Today in this session, we will be talking about innovative ways to undertake climate change. We have four speakers today to share with us concrete examples, different ways of planning and addressing sustainability issues in a context of climate change, in a context also of post-pandemic or may say within the pandemic yet, how we can take advantage of co-creation to build resilience in water infrastructures, for example, or public spaces, or how we are facing at different territorial scales. This session will explore uh, innovation, creativity, uh, monitoring emergency resources, ways to understand climate change in general in our, in our urban areas. I will pass now the floor to our first speaker, Irene Bianchi. She is a postdoctoral research fellow in the Department of Architecture and Urban Study at the Politecnico de Milano and member of the executive board of the Urban Resilience Research Network. And her research activity focuses on urban resilience and urban transition. Irene, welcome and please the floor or the screen in this case is yours. Thank you. Mary, Irene, yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Maria, for the introduction. Uh, I am Irene Bianchi, and today I would like to present the preliminary result of uh, a research uh, coordinated by Professor Pelleri. We are developing with some colleagues uh, from the Urban Resilience Research Network with the support of some students from the Master in Urban Resilience of the WIC University of Barcelona. Uh, the title of the presentation is Our Emerging Post-Pandemic Uses of Open Spaces uh, Reinforcing Climate Resilience, Evidence from Early Adapters. So our goal is to understand if practices that are being developed to support uh, pandemic resilience uh, have the potential to generate positive trade-offs also for climate resilience and from, broad, from a broader urban resilience perspective. Do you see the presentation? Not screen. yet, not yet. Okay. Now. Yeah, yes, now we can see it. Perfect. Uh, so the starting point uh, was to frame uh, resilience discourses uh, comparing a bit different perspective of pandemic resilience and pandemic resilience. We know that the term has been used in, in a broad sense and it is defined by a set of capacities uh, was meaning depend on the system analyzed and on the type of disturbance uh, to which the system, uh, that the system undergoes. So uh, first difference concerned precisely the type of disturbance. We know that climate change is a continuous um, shock set of shocks and stresses that are potentially reversible while uh, COVID-19 in this case is conceived as a temporary disturbance that will uh, disappear one day hopefully soon. Uh, another difference that was uh, relevant for us to conceptualize this, uh, this framework uh, concerns the spatial and time scale on the one hand climate resilience required long-term transformation at multiple scales to take place through adaptability, that is through a long-term incremental change, while pandemic resilience uh, focuses on the temporary modification of local and territorial paths to be achieved through temporary adaptability that somehow resonates more with uh, the development of coping capacity in the emergency phase uh, than with uh, the definition of proper uh, adaptive capacity uh, patterns. In this sense, uh, in, climate, in a pandemic resilience perspective, the, the, the focus in the, is on the robustness of the system that is requires to uh, maintain some urban function uh, stable, let's say, and, uh, and, uh, and functional. 
So uh, within this framework, the, the paper we are proposing uh, discusses the role of public spaces for early adaptation to pandemics, investigating whether these emerging practices are contributed somehow to climate resilience and other broader sustainability goals. What we are doing, we are observing changes in how selected open spaces in the public domain have been used to manage and design uh, in the past months to face challenges that are posed by uh, COVID, uh, the COVID emergency, for example, related to the provision of uh, uh, some services or to changes in mobility patterns. And we are considering, we are asking ourselves whether uh, these changes uh, are contributed sometime, somehow to generate enduring uh, modification in the urban environments, if they are contributed to resilience, or if they will be dismissed in the name of a return to normalcy at the end of the emergency phase. Uh, what we did in this preliminary phase of the review, we identified some examples, uh, 15 examples, that uh, mainly refer to uh, Europe and Northern America, and that cover a, a wider range of public spaces, so from parks to streets to uh, squares. Uh, and we analyzed them through three main analytical lenses. On the one hand, we consider the what, uh, so the core of the initiative. We uh, have seen uh, which were the challenges addressed by the initiative if they were only related to uh, COVID-19 specific uh, problems or if they somehow were embracing also uh, broader challenges, we consider which were the urban function addressed by this initiative, for example, uh, social interaction, mobility, uh, food and service provision, and so on. And we look at the actors involved, considering the promoters and also identifying different target groups. The second step was considering the how, uh, so which were, for example, the tools uh, through which these actions were developed, and these range from urban design, for example, through tactical urbanism technique, to uh, changes in uh, regulation, in protocols, in planning schemes and measures, and so on. In particular, to this respect, we consider the degree of integration of this initiative within existing planning policy and government pr governance frameworks. And finally, we have tried to understand why these uh, measures were, were carried out, considering the degree of integration with urban resilience dimension, and also trying to identify positive and negative trade-off uh, with other uh, uh, resilience objectives. So now uh, in 10 minutes, I won't have time to describe uh, the, the initiative in tea. If you have questions, we can uh, see them later on. What I wanted to tell you is that we identified three main groups of actions. Uh, the first one relates to initiatives that uh, try to address the sanitation challenge and that are uh, trained within a safety paradigm somehow. These challenges do not change the function of a public space, but introduce new regulation or new way of using these spaces uh, to uh, face specific COVID-related challenges, for example, related to the maintenance of physical distance to the provision of sanitation services. Just to mention a few examples, this is the case of the Love Sinks in uh, initiative in Atlanta that provide hand washing uh, services for homelesses, uh, uh, homeless people in the cities, or, or it is the case of some murales that were uh, drawn in Nairobi by local communities under the UN initiative umbrella to support education uh, to the local student, to the, to the local population to prevent uh, uh, the emergency, or still this is the case of drive-in uh, that were, for example, established in, uh, in, uh, in Denmark uh, to allow different kinds of uh, people to go to concert, to go to cinema, or even to follow uh, religious services. The second group concerns the dislocation of uses, and uh, it, is, um, it includes all, all these initiatives that foresees the temporary occupation of open pub public spaces by public, private, or private, private, public, private actors, as well by associations. Uh, this is the example, for example, of open art installations that were uh, presented in New York to allow people to go to an exhibition in the park and following 
the exhibition through an audio guide through their cell phones. This is the, ca the case of outdoor clubs in Berlin, uh, in which there was an agreement between the municipality and the uh, club commission uh, to identify spaces uh, uh, for uh, uh, outdoor gathering, thus trying to reduce illegal gathering. Or this is the case of all the um, uh, occupation of public spaces by local businesses, such as restaurants and uh, bars that we are seeing everywhere across Europe and I suppose uh, across uh, the world. And here we took the example of the gastro cafe zo the zone in Brno. And the last group of actions concern uh, measures that are trying to foresee some changes in the land use destination. Those are primarily related to urban mobility uh, and they foresee the modification uh, of spaces to support pandemic resilience. Uh, this is an example, for example, of uh, La Ciclovia in Bogota uh, that foresaw uh, additional 76 kilometers to the existing spike lane or the case of the Slow Street Initiative in Oakland that was foreseen the installation of some temporary and soft barriers to uh, promote pedestrian and uh, pedestrian path and, 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 uh, and soft mobility. So uh, very briefly, what we did was to map these three groups of initiatives along a transformative potential uh, line somehow. And what we observed was that the uh, uh, initiative from the first group uh, basically uh, refer to temporary adaptation to a temporary shock and therefore uh, mainly focus on resistance and on the permanent function. Therefore, their uh, climate resilience and urban resilience uh, trade-off is quite uh, low at the moment. Uh, the other two group groups of actions have higher potential in terms of adaptation and transformation, and in particular, the one related to changes in land use destination are potentially contributed to a redefinition of urban, territorial, and governance dynamics, and have also a higher trade-off potential in a broader uh, climate resilience perspective. Uh, to conclude, just some preliminary reflection from, uh, from uh, our work. Uh, First, we, we can say that temporal scales matter. Uh, we saw that uh, pandemic resilience is mainly focused on short-term temporary adaptation, but those initiatives might have the potential to contribute to resilience if they manage to also embrace a longer-term uh, adaptive capacity development perspective. Also, we saw that the, 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 the potential uh, of this initiative uh, changes very much according to the tools uh, that, are, that are used. Uh, Temporary practice, of course, uh, might be uh, relevant in the, both in the short and medium terms, but in a resilience perspective, we need uh, them to be grounded or to contribute some time, somehow to the modification of a regulatory and planning framework, also in a longer time frame. Uh, also, for what consider trade-offs between pandemic and climate resilience, um, there were some um, reflection we did, uh, the, the results allowed to observe some trends and dynamics was interpretation, however, at the moment is still quite ambiguous. So for example, on the one hand, um, the pandemics acted as a driver uh, toward changes in mobility patterns, uh, especially as a driver in the, in the policy realm. But on the other hand, um, its contribution to soft mobility is uh, is controversial as it also led to changes in, in, in individual habits that uh, with people that uh, are increasingly uh, using uh, private uh, cars and avoiding uh, to use public transport that are considered to be unsafe. Uh, this is, for example, very much the case in Milan uh, here. The second point considered the uh, reallocation of funds. On the one hand, uh, all these uh, recovery funds and other extra uh, financial uh, uh, channels that open provide a relevant funding opportunity. But on the other hand, the relocation of, uh, of funds uh, led to some relevant budget cuts in other areas that are considered not priority area now in this context of emergency, but that might be relevant, but that are relevant from a climate resilience perspective. So also this would be uh, 
point to, to, to be focused on. And finally, about the relocation of uses. Uh, also, this uh, uh, constant occupation of, of, of public spaces uh, with, uh, by, by, by private and, and uh, small business, for example, might have some now benefit in terms of uh, 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 also social interaction, but in the long term, it might lead to the privatization of these spaces. And uh, this is also something we need to pay attention to. And finally, to conclude, uh, from the preliminary examples we identified, we can say that uh, the initiative we observe uh, did not, were not really able to uh, size this opportunity and to consider open spaces in the public domain really as spaces of opportunity, but they were at the moment mainly focused on using them as a, a privileged locus somehow uh, for the maintenance of vital urban functions. So the, the, the question of whether this will be the case also in the next month, it's, uh, it's still open and we are going to observe it. Thank you, that's it. Thank you, Irene. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, very interesting. I think that an effort in such a, in just in time research of something that it's still open and going on, uh, but very interesting reflections. Now we go to the second uh, speaker, Walter Molinaro. Uh, Walter is an expert of matter in urban planning at the Federico II University of Naples, graduated in territorial, urban, environmental, and landscape planning at the Polytechnic of Torino in, 19, in 2019. Uh, he will be talking about the challenge of adaptation in spatial planning, the role of the metropolitan cities. So Walter, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello to everyone. I'm sharing the video. You can see the presentation. Yes, we do. OK. So uh, I'm here to explain uh, the conclusion and uh, the process of my research. And uh, the first hypothesis of my research was uh, how do metropolitan cities deal with the climate change issue and what is uh, their role? The research was uh, divided in uh, two parts. In the first one, the focus is on Italian metropolitan cities and climate change. The second one is focused on Bologna Charter and the metropolitan planning tools. Of course, uh, at the end, we made conclusion. So as I previously discussed, in first place, we have analyzed the metropolitan cities, in particular, the Del Rio law, which have institutionalized them in 2014. The law establishes the function and supply uh, the metropolitan cities with the two planning tools, uh, the strategic metropolitan plan and the, um, metropolitan, and, and the metropolitan general plan. Um, on the right, you can see a map of Italian metropolitan cities of Italian Walter, metropolitan sorry, you, yes. you have the, the screen, you have to put the full screen and you have to pass the different slides. Otherwise, we, we are stuck on the first one. You don't, ah, okay. Uh, one moment. In Visualizza, you may yeah. put it as full screen. I'm, uh, I'm on full screen. Okay. Uh, no. No problem. Just we are now on the on the slides you were talking about. Okay. Um, now it's changed this the slide. No. See. So, uh, as I already mentioned, the other fundamental topic of the research is climate change. In this research phase, phase, I have paid attention to scientific literature, global data on climate change, and policies that were implemented by each administrative level. Uh, in particular, analyzing the Italian adaptation plan, the, 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 the Italian national plan for adaptation to climate change, emerged the possibility of establishing a new level of planning that deals with the climate change issue. Uh, at this point, the research turned toward the analysis of uh, metropolitan planning tools. The first analysis document was a Bologna Charter, a fundamental document um, 
a fundamental document that uh, places metropolitan cities as the protagonist in fight against climate change and its sustainable development. The eight micro objectives charters are sustainable in use, waste management, adaptation to climate change, energy efficiency, air quality, water quality, green areas, and sustainable mobility. Um, in the other hand, uh, about uh, metropolitan planning tools, uh, was noted uh, that uh, not all metropolitan cities has prepared, it, uh, has prepared their plans. Uh, um, in one hand, regarding, regarding the strategic planning tools, uh, uh, all 14 metropolitan cities have prepared either a strategic plan or a strategic document. Uh, for, um, for the territorial tools, uh, on the other hand, no metropolitan cities has yet adopted a um, metropolitan territorial plan, except for the metropolitan cities of Milan, which, um, which prepared an address document for the preparation of the territorial plan. Um, analyzing the strategic planning tools, it was possible to identify the objectives and action that metropolitan cities have implemented in relation to climate change issue. And uh, it was noted that the uh, greatest commitment of uh, metropolitan cities uh, is uh, referred to sustainable mobility. Um, to sustainable mobility. About uh, metropolitan planning tools uh, was noted, um, no, by analyzing uh, the strategy, uh, sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, the eight, uh, the eight macro objectives of Bologna Charter was compared with uh, the action identified in strategic metropolitan tools. Thanks to this operation, it was possible to identify which macro objectives were involved by metropolitan cities and uh, which were most involved to face uh, climate change. And uh, it has been noted that uh, most commonly macro objectives are uh, sustainable in use, adaptation to climate change, and um, energy efficiency, green areas, and uh, sustainable mobility. Um, each um, on the other hand, uh, uh, in regarding uh, um, each metropolitan cities are, um, are best cases, we um, identified metropolitan city of Bologna, metropolitan city of Milan, and metropolitan city of Venice. And um, so uh, for metropolitan city of Bologna, the adaptation policies of the, metro of the metropolitan strategic plan aim to reduce the effect of climate change in the sector with management, energy efficiency, and smart mobility. Specifically, metropolitan city of Bologna is focused on the sector of energy efficiency. On the other side, the strategic metropolitan plan of, of Milan responds optimally to all the goals set by Bologna Charter. In particular, the metropolitan city is focused on increase and manage the green areas at the metropolitan level. Finally, uh, Metropolitan Strategic Plan of Venice uh, deals with almost uh, all the teams of the Bologna Charter, paying particular attention to the team of uh, waste and water management and sustainable mobility. Um, at the end of uh, this research, a conclusion were made about the analysis of a strategic plan of the study cases. And uh, thanks to this analysis, it uh, was possible to identify the best practices that, uh, that uh, the study cases put in place to counter the negative effects of climate change. In this slide, in this slide it's uh, possible to see which are the best actions to achieve the goals set by Bologna Charter. Sorry, For all, Walter, sorry. Yeah. We can see your, your slides. The slides is not moving. We are still in the metropolitan cities in Italy. We haven't seen any other slide. I, I, I don't know why. No, me neither, but it's fine, no problem. So if you are talking now about conclusions, it's better if you share that, that slide with us so that we can yes, follow I'm, better your explanation. I'm, don't worry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, 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 it's fine, no, no problem. It's just that <laughs> okay. for us easier to follow you, no problem, okay? okay? So, okay, I'm, I'm going on. Uh, for, for almost all the macro objectives, uh, the best practice uh, is uh, to create an integrated approach to manage the problem. And uh, we can note that for the sector of uh, waste management, adaptation to climate change, and sustainable mobility. The best practices that must be mentioned are, for the topic of waste management, the action implemented by, city, by Metropolitan City of Milan and Venice, the aim to entrust waste management to a single body, uh, that will take care uh, about the entire metropolitan area. Um, for sustainable mobility, uh, on the other side, uh, in particular for the, for the sector of public transport, of all three study cases aim to create a single travel ticket and uh, to integrate the first. In this case, we have to mention the experiment carried out by Metropolitan City of Venice, called Metropolitan Venice 24. 
and uh, this action involves um, uh, this action involves the creation of a um, of a single day ticket, which allows an integration of ground and water transport, and consequently of fares and ticket. Moreover, in order to push adaptation and sustainability in transport sector, metropolitan cities are also involved in drafting of the urban plan for sustainable mobility. Uh, for the theme of adaptation to, to climate change, the best practices is uh, to create an integrated risk planning management model, management model configuring metropolitan cities as, um, as uh, the coordinating bodies for the preparation of an integrated metropolitan plan. Um, indeed, for, uh, for the sector of uh, green areas, each study cases aim uh, to create um, to create uh, the uh, to, to increase and manage the green areas at the metropolitan level and the best practices identified are implement the green and blue infrastructure create metropolitan parks and create new green areas uh, finally another best practices um, is increase the participation sensitivity and awareness of population toward climate change issues and uh, it's appear uh, to be um, a winning move to implement a better adaptation uh, finally, we discussed about uh, the role of uh, Italian metropolitan cities in contrasting climate change. And uh, from the analysis emerged that uh, metropolitan cities could play an uh, important role in the management of all those projects that uh, refer to the vast area. Also, metropolitan cities will therefore be shaped as coordinating bodies for the promotion of integrated policies for the management of climate change. Uh, also promote integration between the metropolitan and local levels uh, through the figure of a metropolitan mayor. And uh, at the lastly, uh, the level of government of a metropolitan area does uh, not have uh, planning tools already fully defined, uh, in which uh, um, it would be easier to integrate the team of adaptation and uh, mitigation of climate change. So, um, in conclusion, we can say that um, the goals of a metropolitan level would be promote both vertical and horizontal coordination, promote an integrated approach to climate change planning, promote uh, citizen participation and awareness, and um, at least uh, modulate the new metropolitan planning tools with a specific focus on adaptation and mitigation. Um, also, we made... Um, a little conclusion about uh, the adaptation plan that uh, should be more uh, multi-scale, uh, flexible, um, integrated, participated, and uh, promotes greater resilience. Uh, thanks for the, the attention and uh, sorry for the slide. No problem, Walter. Thank you very much. I, I think after listening to your presentation that metropolitan governments has add another layer of, you know, competence and requirements that we are putting at that territorial scale. Not bad. <laughs> Thank you. Now we go to the our third third speaker, Tanasis Fetsos. Tanasis uh, is a senior researcher at the Institute of Nuclear and Radiological Science, Technology, Energy and Safety at in CSR Democritos in Climate Change and Critical Infrastructure Protection. He has co-authored more than 200 papers in, refer in referred journals and conference proceedings. He has participated in more than 20 you, uh, EU and nationally funded projects and coordinated the H2020 EU Circle project. And I guess that today he, was, he will be talking mostly on this EU Circle project. Uh, please, Tanasis, uh, the screen is yours. If you can, if you can share your screen. Good morning, Maria. Uh, thank Thanks. you very much for the introduction. I hope that everybody can see the screen. We can see it. Go okay, for it. Thank you thank very you. much. Uh, my name is Anas Petros. I come from uh, Democritus in Greece, and I'm going to present briefly uh, this uh, the key the key results and findings from uh, a sister project of uh, Rescue of the EU Circle that uh, was in, funded at, under uh, the same uh, domain. So. Briefly, I'm going to give an overview of the project, some key pillars, how we conducted the demonstration, which I think was the most e interesting part of the project, and what are the key findings and the challenges, challenges for the next uh, generation. 
Uh, so the project was funded under DRS uh, 9 in uh, 2014. It was uh, with uh, 20 partners from uh, seven countries around Europe. Uh, it lasted between uh, 2015 and uh, 2018. So it was about how to, as to establish and uh, monitor the uh, resilience of critical infrastructures, of interconnected critical infrastructure to climate change. And at, at such, we found that uh, the resilience may be the gluing element of four different policies, main different policies in this field. It was about the adaptation, the climate change adaptation, as it can be found in the European community policies, but also in the COP21 in the Paris Agreement. It is linked to several uh, sustainable development goals from the United Nations, most notably sustainable develop, uh, goal number nine. It is also very much linked to the disaster reduction as it comes out from the Sendai framework and especially uh, in, uh, target group D, which is damage to critical infrastructure and disruption of uh, basic services. But it's also the climate, how we can introduce the climate element in the, in the European program for critical infrastructure protection. And we believe in this project that the resilience concept is a very much gluing element of all the different policies. So within the project, we based the work in three different pillars. One was about the framework, how we developed a new framework to establish risk, vulnerabilities, and the impacts to climate change, linking all these things to resilience. We developed several different softwares and tools from the CIRP. Uh, which is a platform for doing all the simulation, harmonizing simulations from different hazards, different platforms, different impact, high-end visualization, and indicators related to measuring the resilience. This was demonstrated in five different case studies, which I'm going to briefly present later on. But also there was a very big work done with the stakeholders. All the case studies in the end, they were co-created with a case case with a case study with a stakeholders from a, either they were national authorities, they were infrastructure operators, they were subject matter experts, they were people from the natural hazards domain, they were people from the national emergency management establishment. From for us, for this project, the core was resilience, and resilience was trying through a multi-layered approach to respond to different questions. Re resilience for what? For what type of climate hazard? What type of, how is this related to which uh, future horizon? Resilience of what? What are the critical infrastructures? What are the networks? What are their interdependencies? How do we monitor the business continuity elements? The third layer was to identify the risks and the impact to the different types of the critical infrastructures. And the fourth layer was uh, to define the resilience in terms of the capacities of the infrastructures to be able to adapt to this event. And the way that we defined resilience is that we put the business continuity element in the middle. We put that there is a resilient infrastructure where when it's able to maintain a service flow continue. And we had several different, five different capacities, the capacity to anticipate how well the infrastructure, it's uh, people that works together, the, the different groups are able to understand the threat, to understand the changing nature of the threat. And it could be also linked to early warning and training. Then there is the element of the absorption, how capable is the infrastructure to uh, absorb the impact, how able it is the infrastructure to reduce the impact or avoid, avoid the total collapse. How, how timely is the third capacity? How effectively can it mount a timely response to, to, resp to, the, to the pressuring event, to the, not to the extreme event, to the climate extreme, which can be also linked to the containment of the damages. Then how fast it can be uh, restored back to normality. And of course, and the last one is how able, how well, and how capable, how what is the capacity of the infrastructure to adapt to the different uh, 
to the, to the emerging challenges. And when we say adapt, it has to do with technologies, it has to do with humans, it has to do with procedures, and it has to do, of course, with the structures, because, and also to the available funding. Because for us, the infrastructure is not only the civil engineering part, but it's also something which is there to maintain a certain amount of business. And this is very much, which I will not go to this slide, about how we established the ECHO uh, creation framework from the design to the validation. The five different case studies that uh, we established and we tested, first one was a heat wave in a forest uh, linking, linked to a forest fire on electric and road transportation networks in South France. And uh, this one was uh, the very first case studies and it proved that the work that we are doing is uh, really interesting because it generated a lot of interest from uh, the people in the case studies and the uh, operators. And I think what was uh, unique in this case study is that for the first time, they did a command post exercise, a civil protection exercise related to how different levels uh, at different units uh, speak to each other, manage to speak to each other using a climate change scenario. And also what we find in this uh, case study with the forest fire is, is not also the frequency and the magnitude of the fire that changes with climate change as it is expected, but it's also the time of the fire. We are going to fi forest fires, which will be more uh, fast in the future and means that you need to have a different mindset when you try to respond to this event. The second, the case study was in uh, Cyprus, which was a big energy hub in the south central part of the island related to different uh, oil facilities, uh, cement factories and uh, port. And uh, it's interesting there how you can start putting people collaborating to each other in a, in a seamless way, because this is something that has not has, uh, did not have happened before. And I think we started uh, putting people collaborating between different facilities, which although they were uh, co-located, they were not very much uh, having close working relationship and understanding the concept of climate change. The third one was a, a extreme flooding in the city of Torbay in Southeast England. And then we, we found and discussed several scenarios. Uh, and there was a very interesting work about uh, the amount of flooding and the future uh, the scenarios that were developed in the, future, in, the, in the return period of the scenarios for the future. But what we found there and what happened is that uh, all the projections for the year 2065 happened during the case study. So there was a proof that uh, identified the hazards for climate change happened during our lifetime. So it's not something very far away and it's not something that we should be uh, considering. The fifth case study was in Bangladesh, was a cyclone in Bangladesh. And I think what we, what was the goal there? And I think what we managed to demonstrate is that although there is a different mindset and different reality and different procedures and different culture for uh, critical infrastructures, it's very critical that a common approach can be applied uniformly throughout the world and prove that uh, Despite all the difficulties we had with data management, data collection, a common infrastructure could be applied. Uh, and the fifth one was a case study in Dresden. And I think here we managed to demonstrate again uh, how well we can combine different types of infrastructures together in one uh, common approach. So su summarizing my presentation, and I think it's uh, that it's a very, it proved that it's very difficult to have all the necessary people from each critical infrastructure operators uh, in the same table. It's very difficult even within the same facility to, to speak to each other, let alone when you go to different facilities that maybe they never, they don't know each other. And we managed to put them, to put all these people together and start understanding common problems, common situations and uh, how they can work together solving a crisis 
which can be amplified due to, due to the future. Yet again, the process of uh, climate change is, as it is something on the very long term discussion, it is not for the daily operation. It's something very far away from the daily operation. That's why there is, we need to somehow make people more, more aware about um, the potential impact of climate change. Then there are several different approaches of how from uh, research and the academic field to the, pra to the practitioner, to the practical level that people know how to operate infrastructures. Maybe uh, from my side, then it's a bit more uh, theoretical, a bit more uh, academic, but the reality maybe it's different. And this is something we need to consider when we are discussing about this. There is, as we said, especially when you start going into interdependencies, the governance of different infrastructures plays a critical role, whether it's going to be centrally or locally or between different infrastructures. Especially in the future, we need to also consider not only project, projected events, but also to the synthetic high-end events, events which are very, uh, doesn't have very much, a lot of confidence or a lot of uh, potential to appear, but it's something we need to discuss. And of course, what also found is that there is no sharing of common tools, especially to work on predefined crisis scenarios, either GIS tools or risk analysis tool, especially if you start going to different types of infrastructures, uh, you have different priorities, different tools. And there is a very big domain for uh, uh, harmonization and homogenization. So my, some main conclusions, just to sum up the presentation, um, there is a lot of interest in the topic, and I think this topic comes uh, comes back and back into uh, not only into uh, into the research field, but also I think there is a lot of interest from the practical perspective. Uh, I think it's very critical for the all the decisions, all the risk-based decision about future scenarios, future funding, future investments should be made should be made on the scientific, on the proven scientific evidence about the potential hazards, the potential risk. And I think the adaptation to the climate change should also be considered uh, when you start build, not only when you build new infrastructure, but also during the maintenance or the upgrade, the restoration of the infrastructure using the build back better concept. And with that, I know that uh, in theory, and as I said before, uh, maybe we know everything, but the reality, as you can see here in this uh, linked electricity and ICT network is very much different from reality. That's why we need people from the infrastructure to work there. Thank you very much. Um, and the floor Thank is yours. You. Thank you, Thanasis. Thank you very much. Very interesting. I think that you have raised one of the issues that we have to deal with, that it's these difficulties that we have to co-create and find solutions together and cooperate. And I think that from your presentation, it's very nice to see that when we create that spaces where different operators and, and you know decision makers and everybody that deals in, in silos, with these things come together, suddenly we have a huge potential to do things better. And I guess that we have to be, keep pushing in that direction. So thank you very much for your presentation. And now we will move to our uh, last uh, speaker today, last but not least, as always, Maria Tellado. Uh, she's, she has a degree in geography and regional planning and master's degree in GIS and a post-graduation in training for teaching geography at secondary school. And since, 2018, Maria is the head of Environment and Energy Division from Lisbon City Hall. So we are moving literally to the ones that are, you know, on the first row uh, nowadays taking decisions. So Maria, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So, 
Thank you for this invitation. First of all, I congratulate the organization, the moderator, the speakers, the audience, and my co-authors. Uh, my presentation will be present, uh, will, uh, will present the work done in Lisbon municipality in terms of urban resilience. As you can see, you have here an image of the principal uh, avenue of the city where the rural space come into the city. In terms of uh, understanding uh, our strategy or policy, uh, we need to understand the principal keywords to work on. Uh, so we are working with sustainable development, climate change, urban resilience, uh, sorry, action plan with the, the issue to Lisbon step up. The vision of the Lisbon municipality uh, prioritize an investment of a continuous and success uh, cons uh, policy on climate change, considering the current situation and also scenarios along this century. The result uh, is an ambition uh, agenda involving interna uh, international commitments and you, as you can see in this image. You can see uh, Paris Agreement combining with uh, the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, uh, the Global Convenient for, of Mayors for Climate and Energy, the Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development Goals, C40 Network, ICLEI, uh, European projects like Rescue, uh, and also this year, Lisbon is the 2020 European Green Capital. The success of our policy requires uh, integration between uh, adaptation and mitigation strategies, uh, in uh, the increase of urban resilience, working together at different levels uh, between local and uh, international level in both directions, using a bottom-up and a top-down uh, approach and also applying a holistic and innovative um, sustainable strategy. Relevant uh, milestones in Lisbon are, of course, the need of decrease of CO2 emissions, combining cl uh, climate and energy uh, key in our agenda, uh, decrease temperature, understanding the global warming uh, is existing, uh, align climate change with different scenarios of emission scenarios. Uh, we are working on a high scenario, HCP 8.5, support uh, reduction in terms of uh, Lisbon footprints, and also the participation in international uh, projects to have financing and to strengthen um, our uh, policy. What are the principal climate change scenarios? We have the, the increase of temperature. We are expecting a sea level rise, combining with the, the problem of storm surge and tide level rise, uh, the decrease of rainfall, and of course, increase of different extreme weather events uh, you, uh, where we expect precipitation, winds and gusts. Uh, today and tomorrow, Lisbon step up with uh, having and applying and reacting in terms of innovative solutions, uh, uh, initiatives aligned in terms of sectorial and in terms of territorial, uh, in terms of the investment made in citizens' participation, and we manage uh, our, um, our strategy, uh, monitoring uh, the work done in Lisbon 
having uh, indicators, goals, and targets to achieve. Relevant remarks nowadays are the work done uh, here in the municipality uh, with all the municipalities from uh, Lisbon metropolitan area in terms of climate change. Uh, the work done in terms of uh, uh, urban and emergency plans already approved and update with, uh, uh, with, uh, in uh, five and five years. Our contributions they uh, given in terms of rules, regulation, protocols and others. Uh, our types of uh, communication focus in different public targets and of course, foster proposals for a continuous improvement. We are going to see um, a small film. What are the principal requires that we need? We need to continue to manage our territory uh, based on the climate change scenarios for short and long term. We need to improve the quality of life for the people who live, work, study, travel around the city, share best practice and invest in the participatory process to involve citizens as key actors who are responsible for the implementation of an innovative urban resilience policy. Based on this continuous and collaborative process, Lisbon Municipality is a city committed with change and one of the best cities to live. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you very much for your presentation. Well, it seems that we are we don't have questions yet from the audience. So let me start 
uh, with you, Maria, since you are one of the in this panel, you are one one person that it deals with uh, responsibilities in the city council, and we are dealing with this pandemic. I would like to ask you um, two first questions. One is, um, I know we are still in the middle of this pandemic, so even though we start talking about post-pandemic and you know that this new normality. Clearly, we are still in the middle of the of this whole situation, new situation. But I would like to know: um, Are you in the city con in the city hall, and in particular in your resilient strategy, that it was clearly oriented towards climate change? But it how this new situation, how the pandemia is, you know, it's it's re it's making you to rethink certain things, to prioritize other things, what will happen? Do you see it as an advantage? And let me understand the advantage, okay? Understanding that there are a lot of people suffering, but an advantage in terms of that it has opened a, a window of opportunity to accelerate certain actions that otherwise will take longer. And I will I will let it hear and to listen to your, your answers. Thank you. Um, in terms of the pandemic, pandemic uh, COVID pandemic, uh, the work that we or the, the policy that we plan to have in terms of urban uh, resilience was changed because the priorities are different. So every day we need to understand what are the principal needs to uh, solve them. Uh, I'm responsible for the area of uh, environment and energy. Uh, here we have some resources. Uh, so every day, we need to reorganize our service to give uh, solutions to what is need. The principal problems today is financing. And uh, that's a big issue to solve it now. Uh, for example, we have different problems in terms of um, water quality to use in different spaces. Um, and uh, we, we have to have all our resources to solve that problem and other problems that we have. We have here the problems uh, we are responsible for the noise, for example. And nowadays, the problems of the noise are not related to the airport or to the traffic, but are um, problems uh, because the people are staying at home and everybody don't want to have the noise of the neighborhoods. So we have different problems, not solving uh, the health problem, but in terms of uh, the manage our territory, it's very difficult to do it. But Thank we you. did, uh, other important is that we'd never had uh, a similar simulation uh, situation before. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, we have a question to Walter, but um, let me, the question says, is there any mention of circular economy in the metropolitan plans of the Italian cities? Yes, the, um, the circular economy is connected to the, to the team of waste management in the metropolitan uh, uh, plants of uh, Italian uh, metropolitan city. And um, quite all, uh, all the metropolitan cities um, uh, face this, uh, this team, uh, but only in connection with the waste management. Okay. Thank you. And from the same person, uh, Georg Hupmann, there is a question to Tanasis. And Georg says, I'm very interested in integrated infrastructure, especially in terms of city planning. What is your opinion on interconnected infrastructure? Does it create efficiencies? On what level? 
economic, environmental, social efficiencies. The micro is closed. Yes, yeah. yes. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the question. I think this is something you cannot avoid. It's by, I think uh, there is no infrastructure which is not interconnected to any other type of infrastructure, and especially given that the way they operate or the way that they help maintain uh, the, the city as we know it. So in terms of this, it's not as it is efficient or, it's not, or not, it is something that is there. And it is something that we must take into consideration when we do urban planning or when we try to understand uh, or try to improve the way that uh, the city is structured or the city operates. But, it, but when we do get this, uh, when we start working with infrastructures, and I think there are all these type of uh, benefits that you mentioned exist. There is economic benefit because one, the efficiency of one, when you, one, one infrastructure, as an example, a road operates efficiently, then, um, or for instance, the IT networks operate efficiently, then you support the seamless uh, movement of people. So in this sense, it's not only social, it's economic, and it's also environmental in a sense, if you start moving into situations where uh, you, can, you try to optimize uh, urban uh, transport with uh, reducing the environmental footprint. So in this sense, it is something that all these things are connected and it's very interesting if you start thinking in a way like this. Thank you, Thanasis. I, I would like to um, ask you uh, regarding what Maria was talking earlier on these uh, financing issues, okay? It's clear that we are facing, that your case studies put on the table examples of stresses and shocks that appear. So afterwards, you deal with this uh, cooperation, collaboration, and these meetings, but once the, the shock was already, uh, already happened. We are now in the middle of a pandemic, and I would like to ask you two things. One is that um, your opinion, I'm sure you have thought about it, like your opinion of the reaction, how do you read the reaction, what we have, we, what we have seen from the different you know, governments and operators and things, you know, everyone that has been confronted to this pandemia in, in basic infrastructures and services, your, your impression is not an, an assessment on, the, on our politicians, okay? But how do you, in, in terms of anticipation or absorption, you know, the, these five yeah. levels that you said, that will be one. And the second one is um, the financing always appears when there are all these crises. What, what were your lessons learned from these meetings after the shocks regarding financing, for example, and resources, economic resources to improve better things? Uh, and my last question would be, would you change because of the, or due to the, to the, your reflections on the pandemia some of your conclusions on this presentation and the one that you just give to us today? Uh, okay, so uh, I'll start from the first one. My, my understanding is that although there are several uh, research projects on uh, the pandemics, not in uh, climate change, but also how pandemics uh, is uh, dispersed in the transportation hub, for instance, I think the infrastructure operators were not, and the government, government overall, they were not ready. And I think they were stuck somewhere between trying to understand what is the dynamics of the pandemic, what is the dynamic of how the virus uh, moves from one person to another or between passengers, for instance, if you go to the urban plant, and what is the normality. So, and I think somewhere there, we didn't have solid scientific evidence to support any decision. So it's, it's a bit of a trial and error. It's not an error, but it's a bit of a trial, policy trial that sometimes it proved uh, successful, sometimes it proved not successful. But I think in my view is that uh, we lacked a lot of scientific evidence to support the decisions that were made. 
the second one is uh, concerning the, uh, the funding. We did it as a case studies. We, it was not after the accident, after accidents. It was an anticipated event in the future. And I think most of the people understand that the, fund, the financial element or the, or the insurance element, for instance, is there and it should stay there. If something will change in the future, I hope we at least we made some people to understand that you need to invest now to be able to be more prepared for the future. Uh, so in the sense, you need to understand that it's not an effort from a single sort of infrastructure or a single type of organization, but something that when you're dealing with climate change is something that you should take together and should uh, try to adapt together. And uh, closing, if I'm going to change anything with the pandemic, I, I would say no. Uh, I think uh, it's very interesting to try to adapt this approach into the pandemics. I don't think it's going to go very far away from what uh, we did, especially if you try to do a risk and resilience assessment. The, the threat in the dynamics of this process will be different, but if you try to use as many stable, solid uh, part of the, your methodology as possible, then at least you can start comparing different things, which is not very simple to do. It, you, it's not very simple to prioritize if you are going to finance the pan response to pandemic and climate change. It's a very decision and you need some some solid base to do that. Thank you. Irene, I would like to ask you, um, I thought it was very interesting, these groups of, you know, of uh, interventions within the public, the open spaces. The, the title was open spaces, not necessarily public spaces. And I was wondering, uh, clearly in, in many cities, we have seen all these debates and discussions on what's going on, the new uses or the new uh, forms that we are um, using, but also giving shape or reshaping our open spaces and public spaces in general. Did you, from your experience and the knowledge, because for doing that, you have to look at, you know, uh, close to cities. Uh, what other kind of spaces do you think are also being changed or modified or, you know, or maybe that we have to rethink uh, from this experience and that will help at the same time uh, or were on the table on the discussion of climate change. Okay, thank you, Maria. Um, in this uh, in this work, we decided to focus on a small piece uh, of the puzzle, um, knowing that, of course, uh, all the pieces are interconnected. Uh, so. From a climate resilience uh, perspective and also from a urban resilience perspective, uh, generally we thought open spaces, both in the public domain, were 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 relevant also to al allow to see change in the use related to mobility, for example, which is mm -hmm. also for uh, climate change uh, mitigation, or also. Uh, the, the, the relation with, for example, the development of nature-based solution or a single initiative based, for example, about uh, on uh, the urban heat island risk reduction and something like this. So public spaces are, let's say, have a, a higher potential maybe that, uh, than other examples uh, to intervene in this specific field. Uh, of course, uh, the, the, the issue is that uh, the, the, the the challenges posed by this pandemic are cross-cutting uh, across sectors uh, and also are intervening of multiple spatial scales and at multiple governance scales. So other types of, of, uh, of spaces that would be interested, for example, to uh, analyze are the working spaces or uh, how uh, this pandemic will affect broader territorial dynamics in terms of um, changes also in, in, in the way in which cities are, are used more, more generally. So there is a debate about the district, industrial district, or um, also uh, 
con commercial spaces. So uh, I think this was just a starting point to focus on something that is more explicitly also in literature related to uh, health and well-being and possible to possibly to climate change mitigation. Uh, a broader step, the next step would be observed interaction also with broader urban dynamics. Thank you. And Maria, may I ask you uh, at the city level of Lisbon, um, in the interventions, uh, I'm sure that Lisbon is also taking uh, project doing projects in the in the open spaces in the public spaces um, of the kind that Irene was showing in her presentation. What kind of debates have created these interventions at the citizen level, neighborhood level, uh, also at the political level? What kind of debates are there? And do you think that for citizens it is a it is now a, the level of awareness that citizens have regarding climate change has increased during this period so that it has become uh, you know like a warning for you know citizens in general to be aware that we need to move forward and and faster and with more you know with more resources and more political will and so on how do you uh, we are finalizing now the climate action plan, uh, combining uh, the, the strategies in terms of adaptation and mitigation. And of course, in our process, we involve in several moments um, sectorial uh, areas uh, and territorial dimensions. So we work here with the parish inside of the municipality. We are divided in 24 parish. Um, we work with uh, some uh, neighborhoods. Uh, it's a small area inside of a parish. And also we work with the metropolitan area, national level uh, and international level. In terms of um, the sectorial dimensions that we involve in the process, we work uh, together the civil protection, fire brigades, uh, urban planning, uh, environment and energy. And also we work with other uh, dimensions. For example, we work together with mobility, with heritage, um, with um, public relations for the municipality. So uh, we work with uh, the services inside of the municipality with other stakeholders uh, at uh, different levels. Okay. And also the transports, I, I didn't uh, talk about them. Okay, thank you. Walter, metropolitan governance and metropolitan uh, areas now dealing with climate change. From your experience in Italy, that it has this new law that they pass creating the metropolitan areas, do you think that um, the fact that, or the, the option uh, to elect directly a metropolitan mayor, do you think it's something that um, would help to reinforce metropolitan governance in the long term? Do you think that it's something that it's not at the moment in any discussion? Do you think, what, what is your, from your analysis and your research? No, the micro is closed. Walter, sorry. Now? Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. I think uh, that uh, metropolitan cities could play a fundamental role uh, in the in the question, in the in the issue of climate change. Um, the, 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 the figure of mayor uh, could uh, integrate the, the metropolitan level with the, with the local level. So the mayor is a fundamental figure for, uh, for, uh, for contrasting climate change. Um, 
and um, in integrate the metropolitan and local level uh, can um, can um, can is uh, the, um, a, a fundamental action and um, and nothing i i think uh, metro cioè in, in the year that uh, that comes uh, metropolitan level uh, could uh, could this uh, could, could play a very important role thank you thank you Tanasis, uh, from your experience, I like very much your case studies because um, it's when you know when 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 you put something specific on the table, then you re one can realize all these operators, private, public, all these different levels. Walter was presenting here uh, metropolitan level that in many literature always appear as the the best place where to deal with you know, a much more complex reality more and more. So transportation, um, I don't know, uh, many things, spatial planning, we can go, you know, climate change now, but also they will appear more and more things. But I'm, I'm wondering, uh, do you think, because the examples that you put on the table are these, uh, you put around a table the different operators, but it not necessarily means that these meetings, this sharing, this coordination necessarily requires a restructure of all the uh, administrative organizations, architectures, you know, this by seal, this in the way most of our institutions, but also uh, the operators work, that it's by silos. Do you think that it is possible both systems to coexist so that we create that spaces where there is a certain level of transversality and integration while we keep certain level of you know silos and like structure by by sectorial the traditional sectorial uh, architectures and and structures do you think it's possible or not or? Yes, i think at this moment that we work or the, this moment in our society i think this is the way that it should proceed it's it's not uh, it's not very frequent that you have the electricity company to run the bus uh, company or to allocate buses or it's not very well optimized if you have uh, the gas infrastructure within a city to 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 again to provide the city. It's possible on a management level, but if you go to the operation level, then things are different, and you have to respect the different characteristics of infrastructures. Having said that, it's very critical also to put people together and at least to know how they which are the points within the service flow or with, which are the value chains between the infrastructures, which one is critically dependent on the others. This is something that needs to be very well identified. You need to identify what are the critical points or the critical operating points within a city and try to, to be able to work around these points, these uh, areas or these uh, serve. It can be on a virtual level, it can be service related work. So, what do you, so you can maintain a very high level of uh, business continuity around the city or around the area that you are working. So definitely you should, de you should go and fully respect uh, how and you should not, so you should be very transvers transver transversal when you are discussing about the characteristics of the infrastructure, whereas at the same time you have to be very open to the, to the places where you start interacting, where is the interface with the other types of infrastructures. And of course, this infrastructure is not always uh, physical. It's not that uh, you have the electricity grid connected to the substation when you go to the water pumping system, for instance, but it has to do with the, maybe it's a common business model mm -hmm. supported by either a central government or a local government. It can be on the human level where you have you can have common trainings or put common people in the rooms as we did or having common trainings uh, or even in uh, disasters like pandemic or like a big earthquake or like a big uh, tornado where you need to know how one infrastructure is going to be pressured 
and how the second infrastructure may be able to alleviate this pressure. So it's a bit of how they operate uh, as well. Thank you. Well, let me put it, uh, open the micros to all of you. Uh, is there any of you that want to make a question or comment something from another speaker so that we can make a cross-cutting intervention? It's not only me <laughs> asking you <laughs> certain issues. It's difficult in a round table telematic, I know, but please feel free to open your micros. The, we are five just in this screen room. And if you have any comment or you want to add something before we, don't be shy, please. <laughs> yeah, sure. Anas, I think go it's, for it. uh, it's very interesting that um, all the four different presentations have many things in common. And it's about uh, having people working together and just go out from the comfort zones of uh, the academic people, of the people from the municipality as Maria Zoao told us. Uh, so I think it's very good if uh, all these people go out of their comfort zones. In, so since this is a very well protected environment, the research environment and the conference, so this may help to be a bit more open. Any reaction? Come on. <laughs> is just... I totally agree, Tanasis. I think that getting out of the, our zone of comfort is the first step so that we still have you know, hope for a better future, definitely. Irene, Walter, Maria Jao. No? I also agree. Uh, that is maybe the most difficult uh, challenge we always have in front of us independently from the uh, specific field we are working on. Uh, and therefore, I was really also happy to listen to uh, Maria's presentation uh, that was also uh, providing insights from a practitioner perspective. Uh, and yes, I would like also maybe later on to uh, contact her to ask if we might also uh, add some examples from uh, Lisbona for, uh, for also our research. I would be very happy to so far, with this communication. Great, thank you, Irene. Of course, you are welcome. <laughs> of course, you and everybody. This one wants to share his work with everyone. Today, we are working on um, European green as a, an European green capital with the COVID. So it's a, a problematic situation uh, today. Uh, this week, we are working on the European green. Uh, green area uh, and we are today facing uh, extreme uh, weather events uh, so it's a, a complex system and uh, the cities are complex uh, and of course we need to work together so everyone here welcome to work with with Lisbon of course thank you Maria and I will uh, take advantage of your last comment and make the close of this session, taking your words that probably working together, coming together as Tanasis was uh, just mentioning a bit before, uh, getting out of our areas of comfort, it's probably the best place where we can start finding innovation and solutions for climate change and other uh, challenges and threats that we are facing nowadays. Thank you very much to all you four speakers for your presentations, your time sharing your knowledge and experience. Thank you to the organization and just stay safe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.